We are going to be in Luke chapter 11 this morning. So if you have your Bible, turn me to Luke chapter 11. Uh, before we get started, and maybe Pastor Larry mentioned this, I'm in the was in the back of the baptistry, and I, I don't get to, I didn't get to hear the welcome, and so I don't know what all was included in that. But if I'm repeating it, then that's good. You can get a double dose, and if I'm not, then this will be news to you. So either way, it's win-win, right? Uh, we're beginning a 21-day of prayer emphasis tomorrow. It starts January 1st, and for the first 21 days of 2024, our church is going to focus on prayer. There's a lot of ways that you can participate with us. First, if you look in your worship folder, there is uh, this little uh, guide that you can stick in your Bible. And as you read the Word and as you pray, you'll know what we're praying for, what Scripture text is going with that. So that's one way. We'll also be posting similar uh, little segments on our uh, social media pages. So if you follow that, it might be a good reminder as you're scrolling through Instagram or Facebook or whatever uh, of where we are in that process. If you want to go a step deeper, uh, we have the book that we're going to be using for the 21 Days of Prayer out in the lobby. And so if you would like to purchase one of those, they're $15. Pastor Brian is out there. You do not have to have the book to participate. As I said, you can follow along like this. But if you would like to go a, a little bit deeper with us, then that is available to you. So it's up to you uh, how you want to participate. I encourage you, whatever way you participate, that you uh, focus uh, these next 21 days on prayer. And uh, God will change your life if you'll spend 21 days uh, earnestly seeking his face, I can promise you he will meet you wherever you are and in whatever situation you find yourself in today. Luke chapter 11. Uh, let's stand as we honor the reading of the word. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, texts in all of the scripture when it comes to prayer. And here's what it says in verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And, and, and he said to them, which of you has a friend We'll go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up to give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Father, we come to you now in prayer, and we ask that you would begin in our hearts for 2024 a deep desire to know you, a deep desire to commune with you, a deep desire to seek your face, a deep desire to pray. Father, I pray that we would come at 2024 with a sense of urgency, knowing that every day is a gift from you. As we've been reminded over the last six weeks here in our own church with the amount of loss we've experienced, that life is precious, that it is a gift, that there will be some who are gathered in this room right now who will not be here at the beginning of 2025. Father, none of us know, none of us uh, have that date on our calendar but Father, we know that each and every day is an opportunity to seek your face, an opportunity to live for you, an opportunity to serve you. So help us to count our days and to make our days count. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable unto you, for you are my rock and my redeemer. I pray this in the matchless and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to give us four truths about prayer that I think will help us as we move into 20, 
24, thinking about seeking the Lord in prayer. And the first one is this, prayer is unnatural. Prayer is unnatural. Uh, I love what Ian Bounds said. He said, spiritual work is taxing work, and men are loath to do it. Praying, true praying, costs an outlay of serious attention and time, which flesh and blood does not relish. That's so true. What he's saying is we don't naturally desire the quietness of prayer. We don't naturally desire to spend time with God. That, our flesh constantly pushes back against that truth. We may know in our head and we may know in our heart that we need it, but yet we don't always desire it. Yet we don't always do it. It's one thing to know about something. It's another thing to do it. It is unnatural. We see this in the very text itself. If you look at verse 1, it says, Now Jesus was praying. Now, first and foremost, prayer, became, prayer was natural for Jesus. He was God. We saw that in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the with, Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus had a desire to spend time with his Father, and he did so regularly. He had built that into his life, into his pattern of ministry, into his day-to-day -day operation. So often when you read the Gospels, you see it says Jesus went alone, went away alone to pray. You see, how much did Jesus desire that, that he would schedule time to go away and pray? I mean, if Jesus needed to pray, how much more so do you and I need to pray? I, I love thinking about Jesus' prayer life. At one point in the gospel, Jesus says, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only do what the Father tells me to do. Well, how does he know what the Father tells him to do? He spends time in prayer. He listens to the Father. And so we see this unnaturalness uh, for us because his disciples are watching him. And they're saying, man, we don't desire to pray like that. We don't pray like that. How does he, how does he spend that time? How does he do that? How does he seem to be able to harness the power and treasure of who God is in his prayer life? And so they come to him and they ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, I don't know about you, prior to me reading this, if, if uh, Jesus was in the room and he says, you can ask for anything you want, anything. I'm here, I will teach you how to do anything. Some of us will be like, can you teach me how to read the stock market? Can you teach me how to forgive somebody? Can you teach me? Like as a pastor, I always think, man, if I was a disciple, I'd be like, teach me to preach better. Like, man, you had that great Sermon on the Mount. You crushed that thing, man. Or teach me how to multiply fish and loaves. That was pretty cool. Teach me how to walk on water. How many of us would say that'd be pretty awesome? But his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, why would his disciples want to learn to pray above everything else. Well, there's a lot of reasons. I think perhaps one of the reasons is that they understood that the reason Jesus was able to do all of the things that the Father had told him to do, the reason Jesus walked in this power is because he spent time in prayer. That prayer was the source. That prayer was the power. That prayer was the fuel behind the ministry. But it's unnatural. We don't naturally do it. It must be learned. It's like everything else that we do well in life. You don't accidentally become a good lawyer. You don't accidentally become a good, uh, good at basketball. It requires doing it repeatedly over and over and over again. Learning. It's the same way with preaching. We have a lot of great guys on our staff that preach uh, we have a lot of guys that we're developing to preach. And you know what? I tell them all the time. There's only one way you get better at preaching, and it's preach. You can take all the best seminary classes. You can watch all of the best preachers online. You can get on YouTube and watch all of the great, great men who have declared the word of the Lord. You can read all the great books on preaching, and all those are great, and they will help you. But you will never be a great preacher until you preach regularly. It's just impossible. And it's the same way in your life. It's the same way in your uh, uh, field of work. You won't be a great teacher unless you teach regularly. You won't be a great pilot unless you get a lot of hours behind the, the stick. That's just how it is. 
And it's the same way with prayer. It's unnatural that we would desire the things we cannot see. Because see, we're in the flesh and we want things we can touch and feel. We want to see instant results. We want to go to Burger King or McDonald's and get our food quick. We, we don't desire to wait and to linger and to rest and to pursue and to continue in. It's unnatural to the flesh but as we grow in our maturity and the spirit, it ought to become something that we become more and more familiar with, more and more commonplace in our lives. And so the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Second thing I want us to see is that prayer is a conversation. Prayer is a conversation. It's about relationship. It's about knowing God. Look at verse 2. And he said to them, when you pray. Notice it did not say if you pray. Because the expectation of all disciples, all followers of Christ is that prayer will be part of their life. Because you can't have a relationship without communication. I mean, if you're married, if you have kids, if you have a co-worker, whatever relationship you want to think about, you can't have a relationship if there is no communication. If you don't speak to one another, if you don't see one another for years and years and years, your, your relationship is going to struggle. Your relationship is going to suffer. There has to be connection, and prayer is the connection point between us and the Heavenly Father. When you pray, Jesus says, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Now, I know a lot of times, and there's nothing wrong with praying these exact words in this exact order, it, but when Jesus says, say the, this, it doesn't mean that that has to be the only way that we pray, the only words that we pray. He's giving us a model. He's giving us an example. Now, sometimes just praying the example, nothing wrong with that. But sometimes we need to just be able to think about how and what Jesus is implying and what he's teaching his disciples as a picture of prayer. And he begins with this word, Father, hallowed be your name. And so as we come to prayer, as we think about prayer, we begin by declaring that God is holy, that his name is holy. This word Father in the Greek is the word Abba. It means dad or daddy. It indicates an intimacy. Now, this would have blown his disciples' minds because in the Old Testament, they didn't even use the name of God, right? They weren't allowed to speak. To, it was too holy to say God. And so instead of saying, saying um, you know, the name for God, they would say, they would make up other names like Jehovah. Uh, and they would give other attributes to God instead of saying his name name. And so this is this picture of blowing their minds of saying, you can call God father. You can call him dad. In fact, in the Old Testament, the word father was only used 14 times. And every single one of those 14 times, it was used to describe God as the father of Israel, that he's the God of the nation. You see the lack of personal intimacy there, that he's just the God of the nation. And so when Jesus says, no, he's your dad, he's your father, he's our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, holy be your name. Psalm 29, 2 says, ascribe to the Lord glory do his name, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness, to declare that the name of God is holy. Second, I think we can see from these words that we need to acknowledge that God is the ruler of all. Look at the next phrase in this prayer. Your kingdom come. This is what Jesus prayed on the cross. Your will, not my will. Your glory, not my glory. Your increase, my decrease. The emptying out of flesh and self so that the power of God and the kingdom of God and the agenda of God takes the forefront in our lives. We're asking God by acknowledging that we want his kingdom to come is that we are saying death to our kingdom. No to our agenda. No to our plans. And yes to his. Your kingdom come. 
See, the kingdom has come in Jesus, but its expansion and its dominion continues forward until his return. And we're asking to join in on that agenda, that work, that God would be glorified, that his kingdom would expand. Zechariah 14, 9 says, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. And on that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. God is the ruler of all, and it is his kingdom that we are pursuing. And then Jesus says, give us each day our daily bread. You see, God wants to provide for our needs. He wants us to seek him for our daily provisions. Bread is one of the most simple and necessary things in life. They need to be sustained. You and I need to eat. We can't go forever without eating and drinking. That's why Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. I'm the living water. And here we're supposed to ask for our daily needs. I think sometimes when we think about prayer, we only think that God needs to be bothered when we have something big going on in our life. We think, oh, unless it's significant, unless someone's in the hospital unless there's a job opportunity unless I'm trying to figure out where I go to college or some big decision then we need to pray about it but everyday things I, I can take care of the everyday things see we don't really relate well to this passage give us this day our daily bread why because most of us could go to our cabinet our pantry our freezer and pull out enough stuff probably half of it's expired because we didn't even eat it that we don't worry for the most part, most of us, that's not true in every part of the world and it may not be true in your own, but for the most part, a lot of us have our daily needs because in our mind, we meet those daily needs. But in this day and age, daily bread was important. They, they sought the Lord. God, give us what we need. It's not a, a surprise at all that in the Old Testament, when God was meeting their needs in the wilderness, he gave them manna for one day, not for a week Not for two weeks, not to store in the icebox, but for one day. And if they didn't eat it in that one day, it would go bad. And they'd have to count on God to provide it for the next day. The only exception was for the Sabbath, and he provided for two days. So they didn't have to go out and collect it. God meeting the daily needs. Do we ask him for our daily needs, or do we ask him only for big things? Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory. In Christ Jesus. Then Jesus says, Say, forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. There's a spirit of confession in our prayer. So we, we're seeking God as holy. We're acknowledging his sovereignty and rule over all. We're asking him to, to meet our daily needs, to provide for us as he promises to do. And then we're coming to a spirit of confession a spirit of receiving and offering forgiveness. Forgive us our sins. It's acknowledging that he is God and we are sinners, that we are in need of forgiveness of grace in our lives. It's important that we acknowledge that, that we're reminded of who he is in that way. The scripture tells us in James chapter 3, verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways. I love the way James said that. We all stumble. We all fall. We, Paul says we all sin and fall short of the glory of Christ. Isaiah says there is no one righteous, no not one. We're all stumbling and struggling in many ways. And, and then we can go over to 1 John chapter 1 verse 8 and see these beautiful words. If we say we have no sin, so if we say I'm not struggling, I never stumble, I never sin against God, then John says we deceive ourselves. We're lying to ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Anyone who has the Spirit of God in their life, anyone who belongs to Him, acknowledges that they need His grace, that they need His mercy, that Jesus is their forgiveness. And so, we, if we, de- we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, we say, I'm a sinner, I am in need of grace, He is faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Why? Because he says you're a sinner. And so when we say, I'm not a sinner, then we're saying God's lying. I mean, I I don't know about you, but that'd be a dangerous road to go down. He says, and his word is not in us. 
So we are to come to God with a spirit of confession, a spirit of, of, of giving and receiving forgiveness. And as we ask God to forgive us, to forgive our trespasses, to forgive our sin, we also then begin to look horizontally. Because, see, prayer is more than just vertical. It's also horizontal. As we pray vertically to our Father, we look horizontally to people in need. Sometimes when we say, God, give us this day our daily bread, we ought to also be looking to see who around us needs daily bread. Because you might be the answer to that prayer in somebody else's life. That God may use you to provide the bread, to meet the need. So we ask the Lord, he provides, and then we use that provision to minister to others as well. And it's the same thing with forgiveness. As God forgives you, we then extend forgiveness to others. Because we have wronged God and he's extended grace to us. And we have wronged others and others have wronged us. And so we forgive. We're a forgiving people, a gracious people. And then Jesus finishes this model prayer with, lead us not into temptation, which really is an emphasis on spiritual protection. There's a, there's a spiritual war going on. Most of us this morning got up, the alarm went off, we got in the shower, we had some breakfast, we got dressed, we, we hustled and bustled, maybe you have kids, you had to load them up in the car, you drove over here, you rushed into your Bible study, or you came into worship, and you sat down, and you went, whew. And not once did you ever think that there's a spiritual battle going on behind the scenes. Not once did it occur to you that there's a war raging in the heavenly realms. And that, I'm not faulting you. I'm saying I, I probably didn't think much about it either, except I knew I was preaching on it this morning, so I was thinking about it. But a lot of days I'm not thinking about it. I'm just thinking about what do I got to do to get to work? What do I got to do to get my kids to school on time? Why didn't my kid do their homework? Why didn't I sign their folder? Well, that's what I'm thinking about every morning. Did I pack their lunch? Did they leave their lunch box after I told them to pick up their lunch box? I'm not thinking about spiritual protection, but see, when we pray and we include this as part of the way and we think and the way we encounter God, then we're aware that we need God's presence and protection in our life because there's a spiritual battle going on. Now, let me just say, when it says, lead us not into temptation, let's not be fooled thinking that God's tempted us. Because he has not. In fact, James chapter 1, verse 13 reminds us of this. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed, listen to this, by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. I love this phrase that James uses when he says, we're lured and enticed by our own desire. If you think about what a lure is, if you've ever fished, you know that when you put a lure on the end of the fishing rod and you cast it out there, it's meant to look like something good. It's meant to look like something a fish would want. That's why it works. And so you cast it out there and the fish is swimming around and thinks, oh, that's the best looking meal I've seen all day. And, and it chases that thing and all of a sudden it clamps down on that thing. And guess what? That hook goes through that, that mouth and boom, it's caught. But it's no different in your life and mine. That's the way sin operates. We look at something, at someone, at some situation, at some opportunity, and we say, that looks good. That looks like a lot of fun. That looks like something that I would enjoy. That looks like something that would benefit me. Just as the fish looks at the lure, that's the best meal all day. I got to get that. And so we pursue and pursue it, and we bite down on it. In our mind, we think the same thing the fish probably thinks. Well, if it doesn't taste good, I'll spit it out. If it doesn't work out for me, I'll stop doing it. But all of a sudden, we bite down on it, and guess what? We're hooked. And we can't get free. That temptation, as it grows in our lives, it brings forth death. And so we ought to pray, God, protect us. God, sustain us as we fight this battle of daily seeing things and experiencing things that we know were not good for us, that we don't need in our lives. As Jude 24 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. 
to him who is able to keep us from stumbling. Prayer is so vital in our battle against sin. If we want to sin less, we'll pray more. God, keep me from temptation. God, help me remain strong in the face of earthly, fleshly desires. Third, prayer requires persistence and endurance. It requires persistence and endurance. Sir Walter Raleigh once asked a favor of the Queen, of El- of Queen Elizabeth, to which she replied, Raleigh, when will you leave off begging? And Raleigh replied, when your majesty leaves off giving. Basically, I'll stop asking when you give me what I'm asking for. Look at verse 5. Jesus said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot give up and get, get up and give you anything. Uh, in that day and age, most of them slept in a one-room uh, uh, house. And so uh, they're on the floor at any given time. Everybody's mat and bed was made and out. And so to get up in the middle of the night, remember, it's not like you just flip on the lights. You got to light the lamp and go through the whole. It's a big hassle. And so it was easy just to say, leave me alone. Come back tomorrow. I, I, don't have to, I can't do this right now. If I get up, the whole house is going to get up. Then all the kids are going to get up. Then we got a big mess on our hands. Just go away. So he says in verse 8, I tell you, though he will not give up, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. It's interesting that (laughs) Jesus says he's not going to get up because he's your friend. He's going to get up because you keep knocking on the door. It's like, he doesn't lay there and think, well, it's Bob. I really like Bob. I'll get up and give Bob some loaves. He goes, I hate Bob. Why is Bob knocking at my door? Bob needs to stop knocking at my door. Bob, leave me alone. Fine, Bob. I'll get you the loaves if you'll just go away. Right? The emphasis here is on the consistency and persistence of the knocking on the door. That there will be a point in which the the friend gets up and meets the need because of his impudence. That word impudence means sheer persistence or shameless boldness. It says he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And then it says in verse 9, And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks it will be opened. In the Greek, these are words that are progressive and ongoing. It means keep on seeking. Keep on asking. Keep on knocking. Don't stop. Don't stop. Keep on. Keep on. Keep on. Thomas Schreiner said, the idea is not that we beg the Lord as if he were reluctant to give, as if we must extract something from him that he does not want to give. We are to persist in prayer because persistence reveals what we truly want. Think about it this way. Most of us just celebrated Christmas last week. You probably had some kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews. And they said, said Mom, Dad, Grandma, this is my Christmas. So I want these things for Christmas. And so you got them some of those things, hopefully. And guess what? Now it's a week later. They've already done playing with them. And they probably already said, or within the next couple of weeks, we'll say, next year for Christmas, I want whatever. Right? They haven't even really enjoyed what they just got, but they're already thinking about what they want next year. Now, most of us who have been parents for a while, you know what we do in January when some kid says, hey, I want whatever, you should put it on your list for next year, and we don't even think about it. Why? Because 11 months from now, they won't want that anymore. They'll want something completely different. They, it won't, they, you go back and say, what you ask for in January? They won't even remember what they asked for. And same thing in February. Same thing in March. Same thing in April. But here's the difference. Let's say they ask you for something in January. And then they ask again in February, same thing. They ask you in March, same thing. April, same thing. May, June, July, August. You're like, I think they really want this. How do you know that they really want it in August or September or November versus January? Because they keep asking you for it. 
it reveals what is truly important. See, if something's not important, they'll ask one time and walk away. But if something is really at their heart, something they really desire, something they're truly interested in, it won't leave their mind. It won't leave their heart. Something else. Same thing in prayer. If something is truly important, if something is truly uh, of God that you desire to see or move or experience, man, it won't just be a fleeting thought, God help me with this. Then we've moved on. It'll be something that your heart longs for. Your heart desires. There's a persistence there. These asking and seeking and knocking, they're not one-time events, they're ongoing. They demonstrate persistence. But as we ask, we ought to think about what we're asking for and how we're asking. In, in James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives it generously to all without reproach. So first of all, you can just take away from that scripture that here's a, here's a prayer that God loves to answer. I mean, if you want to know what to pray for, the, one of the best things to do is what we're going to do over the next 21 days and see what the scripture says about what's at the heart of God in prayer. Well, God tells you right now, if you lack wisdom, ask. Why? Because he loves to give wisdom. So he says he gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man and stable in all his ways. Part of what we're asking is because we know that God is able to provide. If we didn't think God could meet the need, we wouldn't ask him for it. So we have to go in faith knowing that God can. Knowing that God is capable. He's, he's, He's got all of the resources at his hand in order to meet that need or to provide that thing. So we go with confidence and persistence and endurance. In John, 1 John chapter 5, it says, And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything, here's the key word, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. If we ask according to his will, Will. Now, here's something I've learned about prayer in my life. I've learned that the more I pray, the longer I pray, the more consistently and persistently I pray, the more of what I ask for changes. I mean, think about that. When we consistently pray and we're consistently seeking God, what we ask for changes. Because God is doing a work in us. He's transforming us. He's, he's conforming us and molding us into the image of his son. That we will begin to desire the things that he desires. That our mindset will begin to think in a, in a biblical way, in a spiritual way, in a, in a kingdom way about things. And we'll no longer finding, uh, find ourselves asking for ridiculous things, but we'll start to align our hearts with the will of God. Not my will, but thy will be done. And so we begin to ask for things like, God, give me more wisdom. Why? Because we're reading the scripture. We're walking with the Lord. Like, I need more of what God can give in my life so I can, what, serve him more faithfully, follow him more fully, lead more boldly. Whatever it is that God, as he begins to shape us, helps us to, uh, to know what to ask for, that we would ask according to his will. And when we ask according to his will, uh, verse 14 of 1 John 5, this is the confidence that we have towards him. Why? Because he continues to provide what we need. Now, here's the problem. Oftentimes, we have a deep confusion in our culture between what we need and what we greed. You know what I mean. We oftentimes ask for stuff. We want God to do stuff. And we think, man, this is a need, but it's really a greed. Or we'll ask God to do something. And one of the greatest things that God can do in our lives sometimes is not give it. Because he knows what you need more than you know what you need. A good example of this would be like if you have kids or grandkids and, and they say, you say, what do you want for breakfast? And they say, well, I'd like a, a waffle with lots of syrup and butter. And you say, all right. And then for lunch, you say, what do you want for lunch? I'd like chocolate chip cookies. 
and a big bowl of ice cream. All right. What do you want for dinner? I want a giant bag of Skittles. All right. Well, next day, same thing over and over again. Now, no parent would do that, right? No responsible parent, no loving parent. Why? Because just because they're asking for it and that's what they want, that's not what they need. And so at some point, the parent comes in and goes, no, you're not getting Skittles, buddy. You're getting broccoli. You're getting green beans. You're getting some baked chicken. You're getting some fish. You're getting something with some protein, some vegetables, because that's what you need. And you can keep asking for Skittles, but I'm going to give you broccoli. Because as your parent, I know what you need more than you know what you need. You think you can live on Skittles, but at some point, that's not going to work out well for you. And see, God is like that in our life. We ask for stuff all the time. But God knows what we need. He's never going to withhold from us what we need. And as you mature in your faith, and you know this because a lot of you are adults, you wouldn't want to eat Skittles for every meal. Because you know what? You would feel sick. And you wouldn't sleep well. You'd spend a lot of time in the bathroom. It wouldn't work well for you. So you know what you do? You enjoy Skittles a little bit, but then you're like, how many times have you said, I need a salad? I mean, I've said that. Like, oh. I mean, after Christmas, a lot of times I'm like, okay, well, it's a week of salads because I've had too much of the other. We know that. Why? Because we've matured. We, we understand our bodies better. We understand our needs better. And so we make adjustments. And see, God looks down and goes like, you don't need any more Skittles. You need the bread of life. You need my presence. You need my power. You need my wisdom. We start asking for that the more we deepen in our walk with him. Which really leads us to the last point, which is the reward of prayer. It's not more stuff. It's more of the presence of God in our lives. The, the reward of prayer is not more stuff. Look at verse 11. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He uses this example. He says, if earthly fathers who are evil, and he doesn't mean all earthly fathers are evil. What he means is a comparison to our heavenly Father. Like we, we don't even have the capacity to give what the God gives. We don't even have the insight to give what God gives. And yet we, because we're image bearers, still desire to give good gifts to each other. Like hopefully at Christmas. You gave good gifts to your kids. It may not be everything they wanted, but you, you thought about it. You said, hey, I think they would like this. I think that would mean something. And so you gave them a good gift. You didn't give them, you know, a, a, a can of real rattlesnakes, right? Like you don't want them to hurt them. So you give them something good. And, and God is the same way. He's not going to give you something bad. He's not going to give you something evil. He's going to give you good gifts. And it says this, how much more will the heavenly Father Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. What, what is this passage saying? It's saying the greatest thing we can get when we ask God is more of God. The, the greatest thing God can give you, the greatest gift God can give you is himself. There is no greater gift in your life than his power and his spirit. And as we mature, here's what we'll find. We'll begin to ask for more of that and less of the other stuff. See, prayer reveals what is in our hearts. And it, and it reveals whether or not we desire the gift or the giver. An immature believer, they are looking for the gift. What can God give me? How can God provide this? How can God meet this thing? But as we mature in our prayer life and in our faith, we say, God, you know what I need? More of you. More of your grace. More of your spirit. More of your power. More of your mercy. More of your wisdom. Oh, God, transform me. Mold me. Shape me. Conform me into the image of your son. That's what I really need. Because I know that when you're doing that, I won't worry about daily bread. Because your word tells me that you provide for the, the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. 
And how much more will you provide for me? I don't worry about that anymore. Because I have you. I have more of your power in my life. So Jesus says, how much more will the Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Oh, as you focus on 2024 and pray, my hope and desire as we walk through these 21 days together is that God will deepen our prayer life to where it becomes more about knowing him, about walking with him, about experiencing him than anything he could ever give because the greatest thing he can give is himself.